Okay. Are we getting Go. out there? However you want to do it. Yeah. Huh? Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Digi Track event. And this is um, blockchain presented by Blockchain Collective. And before we start, I'd like to acknowledge traditional owners of the land on this meeting and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. And welcome any First Nations people joining us today. Um, I would now like to hand over to Nathan Austin from Blockchain Collective to talk about all things blockchain. Over to you. How are you doing? Uh, I'm Austin Lewinsmith from Blockchain Collective, uh, one of the founders of Blockchain Collective, and this is Nathan Burns, also the founder. I want to welcome you today. We're going to get into a whole lot of things about blockchain, what it is, how it works, and really some of the use cases. We're going to break it down to be, to be, to, to simplify it, to really show you how it's going to, how it is already effect, affecting your life on a daily basis that you might not know. And then some of the areas that it, it's going to be moving into and touching on. We've been around the space now for over five years, over five years, um, which is in the blockchain space, kind of like dog years. So what's five, seven, so. Five, eight, 40, it's it's, it's like it's like a long time in uh, in dog years anyway. But the reality is is that uh, we live and breathe this space. We love it. Um, we're passionate about it. Uh, and the reason we actually got involved with the space back uh, well, I was going to say forty years ago, but uh, <laughs> five years ago was we had we were building a project and we realised that globally there wasn't any real education there wasn't any education that actually was accredited and relevant and actually you know the only place that was developing it back then was actually based out of malta um so we actually commissioned a research piece we put together a team and um, we were working with industry all around the world and i believe that these days it's very very relevant that whole upskill reskill and for people to be job ready because the world we're actually in at the moment, it's changing really, really fast. And I'm a big believer in, you know, you've got to be actually prepared to actually um, be a part of what's already happening. And things always happen with or without you. And we're a big believer in it should happen with you. So maybe you can give a little bit of a... Yeah, cool. So, so much like Austin said, the world is changing super fast. And it's, I, I think of it slightly different to that analogy of... Um, it, you either change with it or it happens to you. I think you become either a victim of change or a product of change. So, and, and there's an opportunity to be the change makers at the same time. And with every evolution of every technology we see and every protocol change, we see significant, uh, significant evolution, significant innovation, significant shifts in wealth and all sorts of things happening around the space. So we're right at this uh, time where everything's starting to ramp up. We've got opportunity that we never had before, and it's accelerating. So like the whole analogy of the dog years, it's like light years more so. so you, you sleep one day and you're like, you wake up and there's 15 new things going on in the blockchain space. You're like, what's happening? And it's even hard as someone who's living and breathing it here every day, uh, working on and uh, expanding our own knowledge, it's hard to keep up even like while we're immersed in it. So uh, because the world is changing how it is. I'll probably give a basic explanation. You give a really good basic explanation. So, Go yeah, we'll that. just jump across anyway. So because the world is changing the way it is, we have to identify that there's two significant aspects to blockchain. There's the technical side, which is obviously the coding elements and the technical um, constructs, like working with the APIs, working with blockchains and building dApps decentralized applications and whatnot. And on the other side, there's the applied. And the applied is really fundamentally, how does this apply? How do we actually put blockchain into an environment of uh, commerce, business, and, and so on? So we're right, we're at that interesting point where um, the roles are, are evolving as well. So some, uh, um, what probably one of the most common questions we get is, well, what is blockchain? Which we'll get to in just a moment, um, but also, what opportunities are in blockchain, what jobs are there, and things like that. And we'll also cover that as we go along. So 
add a simple thing, and probably some of you are familiar with blockchain, maybe you've never heard of it before and you're kind of, what is this thing? Uh, a lot of people would have heard about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and now NFTs are getting their phase and we've had decentralized finance, all this sort of stuff. We'll, we'll touch on these in a, in a moment. But what blockchain is in its simplest form is it's a list of who owns what. So it's a database that keeps records of who owns what. Now, if we put it into a bit of a, a context of where we are right now, the internet is very much an internet of information. It's easy to access. Uh, we can find what we're looking for. We just jump on Google and whatnot, and there it is. And these are all just a protocol. It's just, uh, the whole internet is a protocol. It, it went through evolution, and we're at the HTTPS stage now uh, as a protocol. And that's where we're allowed to share information freely. But the internet is nothing more than a copying machine. It's a digital copying machine. Because if you want to uh, find information and you download it or you get sent it, it's a copy, 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 copy. So everyone ends up with a copy of it. Now, it's very hard to uh, basically to own the value inside of a digital world like that where everything's a copy. Because let's say, for example, I sent you something of significant value. Let's say a property deed. I send that through email. What happens in that scenario is really simply, I've made a copy by sending it to you. I have it in my outbox. You have it in your inbox. Now who owns the property? We both can prove we have the deed. Now, if you send it on to 10 other people, we're going to have fights, right? Not between you and I, but between people saying, hey, that's my property. I've got proof. Now, in the world of blockchain, and this is where That's Web3 very relevant, very comes relevant in. Spot, a lot of countries, especially outside of Australia, right? Yeah, well, who knows even with Australia these <laughs> days, right? So, but let, yeah, let, and it's happened many times before where people have, um, have changed records inside of uh, land titles and things like that. And, and literally, people have been forced off their own land, even having it for 100 years and whatnot, simply because they couldn't prove ownership because the database got manipulated or something of that nature. But let's look at a blockchain-based scenario. In a blockchain-based scenario, it allows for digital ownership. It allows you to own something in a digital realm and prove ownership. So how does that happen? Let's say in that same scenario, I sent you a deed to a property through blockchain. In that scenario, I'm actually, I'm actually giving up my access to that <coughs> record and providing access to you. So now I no longer have access, you have full access. So you can prove ownership, I no longer <laughs> can prove I own it. But there is a trail to say that I've sent it to you. There's a record. So it's very transparent. It's a record of who owns what and kept in a chronological time frame. And then it's immutable. Immutable meaning it's not able to be just changed. You can't go back in time and change the records. What you can do is you can append, you can change uh, future so if you make a mistake, that's OK. Mistakes happen. You can rectify that. But there's a record, a permanent record of that transaction, permanent record of that change. So where this becomes supremely valuable is allows peer-to-peer -peer transactions. It allows to cut out the middle um, centralized bodies or the controlling mechanisms or the people who are getting involved in, in trade where they don't necessarily need to be there for any other reason than trust. So when we can have a network, a blockchain network, which is inherently baked with trust as a component of it, you don't need to trust the other party to transact. It allows for free trade between peer to peer without any middle mm -hmm. people, middle authorities. Uh, and not to say it's ungoverned, not to say it's unregulated, but the simple transaction of trade can be more free between peer to peer. So it opens up a world of opportunities. And I guess one of the important things there is you can also be choosing who's validating that information. So having those single sources or those multiple sources of truth that are actually validating. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But one of the things I want to get into is, and we're just going to talk a little bit more, is Nathan touched on technical versus applied. Now, well, I'm not technical, right? And, but for every project that you can imagine globally that's built where you've got coders sitting there coding and building and architecting a solution, you've got to have the business thinking. You've got to have the applied side. You've got to actually take the idea and map it through a process that then you can hand it off to coders and you can hand it off to the rest of a team 
and you can be talking the lawyers, account, whoever else is involved with actually building out a project to actually execute on. And I believe one of the important things when you're dealing with emerging technology is you can't use a lot of the same old systems because a lot of old systems, they were built, you know, or designed 10 years ago or 15 years ago. When you start talking emerging technology, all of a sudden you're breaking the mold. So when you're breaking the mold, you want to be using new types of business thinking. And uh, some of the, you know, the, the curriculum specifically that we're going to be talking about today is based around blue ocean strategies. It's based around reimagining the way business is actually done, should be done, and then there's actually context all the way through. So what we're going to do now, we're going to get into a couple of the lay of the land. Some of the, what? Hang on. All good. There we go. Okay, cool. Because there's a lot of stuff going on at the moment, and a lot of it you'll hear is buzzwords. And that you, you know, it's, it's easy, I guess, to almost get lost in the noise. And the reason it's easy to get lost in the noise is because it doesn't matter if you're talking Elon Musk to making a comment, I bought Bitcoin, or I've just bought Twitter, and now we're going to have digital assets here, and now you're going to be able to actually have an NFT as your uh, ownership. That right there on my watch is an NFT. It was actually designed by my 13-year-old son, who I believe is sitting in the, in the room here. Put your hand and wave. Smile and wave, son, smile and wave. <laughs> now, so what are some of the actual areas? And we're going to cover off this and we'll sort of bounce backwards and forwards. One of them is Metaverse. Ever, you know, Facebook recently changed their name to Metaverse? Well, or they yeah. changed it to Meta. Nice marketing play, well played. But uh, the reality is that is one Metaverse. It's not all of them. And all Metaverse really means is it's a digital arena where people can play or do or learn or... Uh, participate um, that's pretty much online. So, you know, really a lot of these, uh, and we're, we're going to actually have a bit of a play with the metaverse uh, in, in a little while. Um, asset tokenization, Nathan touched on this just a moment ago. Things like uh, the real estate. I mean, Dubai actually has now their entire land registry on the blockchain. Uh, last time I signed a real estate contract for a rental, they disintermediated that process using smart contracts. Now, is it, I'm assuming people in here have signed real estate contracts before for a rental. Mm -hmm. Is it a pain in the ass? <laughs> no, I'm the only one that ever thought it was a pain yeah, in the ass. It's pain yes, in it's the a pain in the ass. We can get some interaction going here. It's a pain in the ass. You go, you lodge a bond. Then you've got to trust the fact that the person's actually going to lodge the bond. Now, they've changed it a bit now. They, lo they lodge it at the post office or whatever. And then the next process, you need to have the owner of the property notified. The agent, you have to go in, you sign the papers, then they bring it back, then it goes forwards, and there's backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. I literally hit one key. That same time I did that, it wrote a smart contract executed on the blockchain, and all of those different processes executed in one transaction, and it was on the Ethereum blockchain. Now, Nath, you get into some of these other... Yeah, so the biggest part of blockchain that is um, yet to be fully um, built out is the decentralization of virtually everything. And uh, one, of, one of the big ones that I think is important for all of us to understand is about decentralizing our <laughs> identities and having sovereignty, right? Now, and that it comes to a point where we've all been through the experience. You open a bank account and they go okay, we need your driver's license, we need this, we need that, we need proof of address, we need all this information. And we provide freely mm -hmm. and because nece necessarily we have to provide all this information in order for them to simply open the account. Now, we've, we've provided this to a person who's working in a job who we don't know their background, we don't know what they're going to actually do with their data. Now, sure, they've got rules in the bank to make sure that they don't leak data and same with every other centralised body. But we're all exposed to it every single day, uh, security uh, hacks and all sorts, cyber hacks and all sorts of things where there's data leaking everywhere. And this is our identity. This is our information. Like, has anyone in the room ever had any experience of identity fraud? Or, uh, yeah, so, and, and is it, yeah. it can be a tremendous inconvenience to, to your life. And there's all mm. sorts of, you don't know for how long you're explo exploited for or exposed. So identity and decentralization is a very powerful thing because by decentralizing, what it's really doing is it's taking <coughs> back control of it. That's what it is. So imagine how good it would be if you validated one time your identity. 
and it was encrypted. So no longer that information is readable to just anybody and everybody. I think it's this laptop when it's going to sleep. Um, <laughs> wrong finger. So imagine in that yeah, situation... Let me switch back to... Yep. So in that situation with identity, um, if you I validated yourself and now all of a sudden you go to open a bank account, you no, no longer need to be exposed. You don't need to give all your information. You just simply say, here's my encrypted hash. It's just a string of numbers and letters that mean nothing to the outside world in that sense. And they, they check that and you've got a validating point, the bank you've previously been with, a governing body or something of that nature that says, we know this person is who they say they are. <laughs> now they open a bank account for you, which requires no extra paperwork, all these sorts of things. Now you think about all, all the data points along your life where you're filling in your email, your name, and all these sorts of things, and you're just freely giving, 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 and you're hoping that that little padlock on their website is genuine. You're hoping that there's not someone in the back end who's just extracting it and putting it on the dark web for sale. So identity and decentralization creates sovereignty. It brings back the, the control. And, and then we can talk about that in the form of cryptocurrencies, peer-to-peer -peer transactions, being able to be your own bank. You know why the banks have such leverage on most people is because everything is going through. Like we do an international transfer an, inter in an international transfer through the bank sometimes takes three, four, five days. Sometimes the money doesn't appear for two weeks. Why does all this happen? It's simply, it's an expensive process where it's centralised party validating you, moving to another centralised party who's validating you. And it's, it takes ages, it costs a fortune. Imagine just a peer-to-peer -peer transaction. I want to send you money overseas, I send it directly to you. The ledger, the blockchain, just updates who owns what, you now have it, I no longer have it. Done, right? So, and yeah. we have control over that. So if, if I don't want to send the money, I'm not going to send it. You know, it's <laughs> as simple as that. It's, yeah, well, would, yeah. Just a quick yeah. question on that, I'm just curious. So does that mean banks obviously would not be on board with this? No, they, they, no, good. They, they, they play the short term money, Absolutely, they do. We are going to have a question, just to that, that, clarify. Great, great, great question, great question. we will have questions okay. at the, in the second part. I'll, I'll so. dive on that right now, though, yeah. because that's very, very uh, relevant, is the thing is banks are using it too. They're starting to use it. That's why currently you can do, like, same-day instant uh, payments between banks, whereas go back five years ago, it would take three days to move money from in Australia. Me standing here to another. you standing there. Yeah. and, and <laughs> With you, the same bank sometimes even. And right? so that's yeah. like Osco Payments is a ledger. It's, a, it's, a, uh, it's exactly that. It's a di uh, digital ledger that the banks have agreed to use and they just update the record and that's why payments are happening faster. So they are using and adopting the technology. Yep. They don't want to tell you so much and they don't want to empower you so much to just take it outside of their realm because they're making money on it still. Yeah. So, but yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's also one of those very interesting ones, uh, Web3, uh, probably talk about a little bit about Web3. Yeah, so, uh, so Web3, and this is where uh, we go with the evolution of the internet. So where we are currently is we're in, we're, we're starting to see it and we're starting to experience it. But what that simply means is you have uh, a browser interface that has a wallet attached to it. And as we move further into Web3, what we'll find is the internet's going to change largely from uh, an advertising place where, again, our data is exposed and we're, uh, we're exposed to lots of advertising bombardment, but more to a consumer creator model. And, and it's happening, it, it, you, you'll see it, and more and more there's like paywalls and things that are appearing, but that's inconvenient from a, a user experience. If you have a Web3 integrated wallet, you've essentially got a cryptocurrency wallet attached to your browser experience. If you want to access something, it just says go in, you click it, it deducts a tiny payment out of your account and you carry on. And over time, the internet's going to evolve very much into mm. that if you're adding value to the internet, if you're creating content that people are consuming, there'll be micro payments all along the way that you can earn income for generating. And, and on the other side, um, if you're using consuming, it goes the other way, you pay for it. And so a good example of that is Brave Browser. Some of you guys might already be using Brave Browser. and a Brave Browser. That's actually got an inbuilt uh, blockchain wallet into it. And the idea there 
is that if you turn on ads, you get paid because you're exposed to the advertising that's mm. there. Right? If you turn it off, they don't pay you for it. So you have an ad-free experience. So you, you basically get a true experience. I think yeah. it's a relevant thing as well. Go for it. No, it's just a, and a more secure experience. I think a lot of the, look, I was uh, at uh, Blockchain Week about a couple of weeks ago, and that was a, a very interesting one because there were so many different people from so many backgrounds and demographics. And, you know, you've got all of the big major accounting firms that are all experienced, like EY. EY's been involved with building out their, uh, their, um, their, their, their blockchain team since 2015. So, you know, sometimes people think, oh, yeah, people who got started in 2015 or 2017 were early. You had a lot of the big, big companies actually making investment. They see these things as being the next logical step. And what, yeah, mm. that's right. That it, but I can also tell you, they might have invested in 2014, but I can tell you that all of the banks were sitting there going, no, 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 this is bad. Stay away. This is... Yeah. That's right. They're hedging their bets both ways. But um, really what's happened now is blockchain has... And, you know, we obviously made, uh, made a fairly s s uh, serious investment in the fact that education was going to be necessary. And the fact... And, and what we believed in our conversations and part of our mission statement when we first got started was we believed and were right that, the, uh, that blockchain is going to end up being and is b proving to become the spine that interconnects all of the other emerging technologies. So when you start talking about AI, big data, machine learning, and cybersecurity, you need a way of being able to secure that data and secure that information and actually have underlying technologies that are going to actually provide that, that layer of security. Now, we're in a bit of an interesting situation because, you know, from a cyber, from a cyber point of view, have we, got, have we got some cyber students in here? We've got yeah. a few cyber students in here. Cool. So. I had some really interesting conversations around cyber. And one of the conversations was, we've just spent the last 20 years giving away our data for free for an email address. True? How do you put that genie back in the box? How do you put the back in the bottle? Back in the bottle? The bottle. The bottle? The bottle? Whatever. Genies Wherever come. the genie goes, comes Out of the from... Lantern. You know what I mean, right? The point is, how do you put it back? And there isn't, but what we can do is we can help secure things moving forward. And as you start to get, you know, things that are transacting backwards and forwards and it's becoming more autonomous, we have to have that security. Otherwise, we're all um, in trouble. That's all right? Yeah. Not swearing on the uh, open forum. Cool. Now, NFTs are a fun one. NFTs. Anyone know anything about NFTs? Yeah? Sorry? Not a fan? That's all right. Don't have to be a fan. other functionality and this is this is an important one because i believe because there's there's for instance the first tweet by jack dorsey that sold for 2.9 million dollars someone went they jumped on the hype train right and bought it for 2.9 million dollars all he did was he tokenized turned it into a digital asset where someone owned that first tweet now the reality is it was jack dorsey selling it so someone bought it for 2.9 million dollars then he went to resell it uh like a couple of weeks ago, and it was... They wanted to list it for some stupid number, like $20 million or something like that, right? What happened, it went to auction and it got, it was, it was, what, $130 no, was no, the highest? No, it, yeah, didn't, it, no, it didn't go over. It, it was thousands, and you get a couple of people trying to pick it up. But the problem was there's no functionality behind it. There was no community behind it. There was no real use case for it. Now. One of the really interesting ones that, are, that is absolutely outstanding and where NFTs or non-fungible tokens become something exciting is, for instance, the Bored Ape series. Now, the reason the Bored Ape series, and I'm going to let Nathan talk a little bit more about the tech. Do you want to talk a little bit about the technical side of NFTs? Because I'll talk a little bit about sure. the... So firstly, NFT stands for non-fungible token. What that means is a non-interchangeable token. So let's say currency, today if you have a dollar coin and you have another dollar coin, they're fungible because they're interchangeable. They have the same value, they represent the same thing. In the sense of non-fungible tokens, it's a unique identity attached to a single thing or a set of things. So you could create a series of 
um, let's say, for example, you could have a hundred of a single thing, and they're interchangeable, but only within the hundred. <coughs> Outside of the hundred, they're no, no longer interchangeable. So non-fungible token allow, allows a digital representation. So in the back to the property analogy before, if you were to tokenize land titles, you would do that with non-fungible tokens, because every single plot of land has a different value set, different size, different location, etc. So you would use an NFT in that situation. And NFTs can be attached to uh, all the collectibles, the art and all sorts of things, but they can be very functional. They could be, mm. they can be tradable, they can, in the sense of value exchange. And this is what, we're t what I, I mentioned at the beginning, the whole idea of owning value is not, it's not about the hype of cryptocurrency, although some people see the need for it. Uh, it's not about, uh, and that, and that in, in that sense, you need an exchange of value that is fungible. That's why Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies for transactions are not NFTs, but they're fungible, because you need a representation that's interchangeable and exchangeable. When you get into NFTs, it's the opposite. They're representing something. Mm. And they could be exchangeable, they could be tradable. You can have function built into the capability of that. The sense of having an F NFT that represents status, um, uh, yeah. reputation, all of these things which are quite unique and can be unique to yourself and you can pile value on top of that representation and transport <laughs> it with you becomes uh, an asset in itself. I guess some really, really good example of, of, of use case. We, the Board Ape series, um, some of you might have heard of it, some of you haven't, but you know, they came out and they, they took off and it probably had stuff, something to do with Wall Street bets and all of that uh, short squeeze stuff that went on uh, a little while back. But, um, you know, they bought out this series. Now, for some people, they look at it and go, that looks like a bored monkey. No? Well, it is, it's a bored ape, it's not a bored monkey, for starters. Um, but what happened was there was, you know, there's been major excitement created around this. And yeah, sure, people bought them and originally they would have bought them based on the fact of what it is. But now the amount of community that's been built around it is absolutely outstanding. I was, uh, I was uh, talking to someone uh, recently down in Sydney and they were like, you know, I was over, at, uh, over in New York, I was at an event for this, uh, for this and, and some of these go for millions of dollars, millions of dollars. And they were at an event in New York, and they said, and, and this, is pers uh, this particular person is worth a, a huge amount of money and, and a very, well very, very, very well-connected person and probably well-known by most people in the room. He could not get into specific after-parties and functions because he did not have a blue board ape. A blue board ape. Now, that's fine. They're, what they're doing, and they've done very well, is they've created community. They're creating utility. They recently launched a, a metaverse where there was plots of land. So people who owned it actually got airdropped and got options into other things. So now what they're moving, doing is they're moving towards an entire ecosystem play, where it's not about having a picture on your watch. It's about having being part of a community. For instance, Gary Vee is someone else who, you know, whether you like Gary Vee or not, one thing he's doing is he's building community around his NFTs. So it's giving access to different things and him being able to actually add value after the fact. Coca-Cola, all of these other major companies, they're all moving into NFTs because they want to play in metaverse. They want to play in the digital <laughs> space. They want to be able to actually reward people past giving them a ticket saying, hey, you were here. And another thing with NFTs, and just to be clear, is most of them are garbage. <laughs> right? Let's be clear. Yeah. But there will be a percentage of the market that gets generated out of this hype yeah. phase. And the beautiful thing about hype is it precedes innovation. So you'll yeah. get hype. You, same thing. We got the cryptocurrency hype back in 2017. And then we got a lot of innovation. Then we, yeah. had, uh, we had decentralized finance hype. And then all of a sudden, we got a lot of innovation. We got NFT hype and a lot of innovation. So it's, it's this cycle that keeps playing out. But the thing is, a lot of it won't survive. A lot of it will be worthless in the time to come. But some of it will be groundbreaking and change, uh, change the game for NFTs. It will paint a new future. And each innovation is like a stepping stone to a different way the future becomes. And to the point of the metaverse, uh, which we're going to jump into in a, in a moment, but to the point of metaverse, 
NFTs can be collectible, usable, tradable items inside of a metaverse scenario where, and I was talking to the young lady over here before and she's creating 3D graphics and she was like, oh, you know, maybe that's, and that is absolutely a business opportunity right there is to create 3D items and actually mint and sell them within the metaverse. So people can build out their virtual reality worlds or virtual worlds with items that they own, that are tradable, they're saleable and whatnot. And we know of some metaverse projects where they're offering goods and services where you purchase inside of the metaverse and it actually gets delivered to your house. So you're now mixing that shopping experience in the virtual world with goods and services that deliver. So, you know, like, the, where is it going? Well, you know, what's that Ready Player One? Hopefully not quite that extreme, <laughs> right? Hopefully not that not quite that far, but look, w the, the boundaries are unfounded. Like we haven't even gotten close to the edge of what's possible and the evolution of it, it, it includes every facet of business, every facet of skill set, all of what you already can do in the world today, plus now the digital representation of it. And some people live in that space. They don't want to go, um, you know, like having a fantasy in a virtual world of um, like riding a dragon around the, well, you can't do that. It's hard in the to buy a world. dragon. Yeah, hard, the, hard like to find a dragon. Of, outside of outside the universe, moment. right? <laughs> yeah. So these things, you know, you can take your imagination to a new place. And treatment of um, like different health modalities, mm. uh, like even yeah, all sorts of cool things that are happening <laughs> in alternate realities, which are helping for treatment of PSTD and stuff in different environments. PTSD. So, whatever. PSD. PTSD, that's one. Now, just uh, on, on the uh, on the NFTs, this is a bragging about the sun thing. Ilan, jump up for a minute. And this is uh, just an example of. He started off. This is uh, this is actually my my thirteen year old son. So, thank you, thank you, bragging rights, right? This is, and I decided to throw in one of his NFTs in with the uh, bored apes, just because, why not? I can. Um, but he started off with his first. NFT series, which he built about a year ago. Funny enough, he was actually here a year ago. Just say hello, wave. Hello. Smile and wave, son. Hi. Smile and wave. Um, and he built his first NFTs back a year ago. And his NFTs, they didn't have functionality. They were cool. Some of them had different rarity and different qualities, but they didn't have a lot of functionality. They didn't have community. So since then, what have, you know, he, he started building Discord channels, started building communities, started working around the actual contracts and what those NFTs are actually going to be used for in the future, which is pretty cool because it just changes the way that innovation, and I believe a lot of the innovation is coming from kids. You know, they're, 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 their brains work differently to, to a lot of us, or me, older fella in here. Um, sorry, you can go sit. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's jump into it. So let's talk about the role of consensus, because this is the, the reality is, is Consensus is simply a way of agreeing, right? Let's just uh, let's just do a quick example here. Can everyone got a calculator on their phone? Just want to check something here. Now, if you guys can help me with a problem. So Pretty complex. I suck at maths for starters. So can we go forty-five? times 93 divided by 6 times 85 minus 2. Now, can I get, what did you guys get? Yell out your number. Just yell out your number. Really? Mm -hmm. I got 58,285.5. You see, in a blockchain scenario, you were all validating nodes. We were all validating exactly the same data. But the reality is, the rest of the network kicked out my transaction because it wasn't correct. So that's the role of consensus, and that's pretty much how blockchain works. 
And that's one of the, uh, one of the ways that uh, it's a really simple, easy explanation of consensus and the way it actually works as far as validating information. And where that comes into play and becomes really important is if you've got information that needs to be uh, as true as co and correct as possible, um, redundancy is key to that. Having multiple validating, um, like let's say for example in Internet of Things, when you've got sensors and things, let's say you've got some medicine that's ultra critical on temperature. Mm. If you have one sensor tracking the temperature in the, in the cool room on the transport and along the journey and something goes wrong, let's say it, faulty reading, you, you're going to terminate the stock, you have to, because it, it's outside of scope, it, it's no longer any good. What about if you had five sensors in that, one of them reads differently? You're going to take the, the other four, if they're all in consensus, as the true and correct. Now, this works perfectly in the environment of blockchain because it's already creating consensus amongst the data and giving you that truest and most um, uh, agreeable answer. Right, so in that situation, you don't terminate your stock. You say, okay, there's a problem with this center or we, we invalidate that transaction from that node or that sensor and we carry on knowing that we've got medicine and there's four out of five um, have validated the same data. Right, so in a simple context of uh, when we talk about connected things, Internet of Things and all of this, that's why, as Austin mentioned earlier, the fabric that connects all the emerging technologies comes into play when you have simple data points that you need to uh, to make true first, or at least to make sure it's the most uh, agreeable answer. Cool. So we're gonna we just jump across. We decided um, just to have a bit of a play in a a a metaverse. And we're gonna use a, a decentraland just because it's simple. If you ever want to have a play in this, you just literally download MetaMask. Uh, M-E-T-A-M-A-S-K on your phone and then you'll literally have a Web3 solution. So that, see the little fox right up in the... I was going to throw a pen, but that's probably not a good thing. Uh, right up there, right? This, for this example, literally, the Web3 simply means that your, your, your computer's talking and interacting with the universe without you having to do anything after you've validated... What? Connecting with the universe. Connect metaverse. The, yes, metaverse, universe. <laughs> You know what I mean. So I'm going to let Nathan get into this one. So. Yeah, so just really simply, uh, in this case, MetaMask is a plug-in. There's plenty of wallets that are free. I recommend for everybody to get into the, uh, into the notion of getting exposure to Web3, whether you do it through a Brave browser and just simply go and uh, set up the wallet, which is it's very simple. You set it up and, and you'll start using things uh, in the Web3 way, which you, you may not even recognise that you're doing, but you'll start earning tokens, you'll start uh, getting the benefits of Web3 access and so forth. So in this case, uh, this uh, wallet's got some Ethereum, not much, just some dust, basically. Uh, we call it dust where it's like an in insignificant amount. So what, there's a dollar, dollar sixty-five in there? Yes. I'm glad <laughs> I found this, found this wallet. Right, so, but the idea is uh, Decentraland is a metaverse where it, once connected to the wallet, just as I mentioned before, it becomes a consumer creator type environment where you can get into this metaverse and if we just jump across um, rather than like relying on internet in here. So this is actually, again, it's a free environment to go into. You can be a guest in there and not connect your wallet, but you're not going to be able to do much. You can just look around. In this situation, these are pieces of art that people have created. Let's slow down. Slow down slow a bit down. so we don't get motion sickness. <laughs> but I'll probably right. be the first throw to throw up, up there and then throw a pen down. So there. Um, <laughs> in this environment, so somebody created that art of Harry Potter. I would say that's pretty awesome, pretty awesome graphics. That art is, in this case, not for sale, but it could have been for sale. And I could have been in, I could have had a bit more than my dollar sixty-five in my wallet, and go, hey, I want to purchase that digital art. Now, in this case, digital art, as we've sort of talked about, it's not necessarily the be-all and end-all of, uh, of Web3, of NFTs and so on. But there may be some times, and there's ticketing and all sorts of things, where you can, you can actually attend events inside the metaverse, where if you've got a certain ticket, it grants you access to whole realms inside the metaverse, it, into gameplay. So, for example, I know in this metaverse, there's a poker room, there's poker tournaments. And depending on what you have as far as, uh, again, access status, 
it then so grants you into different games, ga like entry to games and things where you can literally earn cryptocurrency and other uh, forms of value inside the metaverse, which you could take offline and actually exchange for real money. Like it's, when I say real money, it's hard to say what's real money these days, but <laughs> let's call it fiat, cur fiat currency that you could you buy go. your groceries with. Right? So this, this, again, like it's worth to play around with some of these things, not to get too, um, like we're not going to go too far with it because we'll all get motion sickness. Yeah. But the point being is these environments allow for all sorts of stuff. So it can be, so in this one, there's art, there's gameplay. You can ride a dragon. I was doing that this morning, riding a dragon around. Um, just for fun, that was before but I left the house. you get get out of um, get out of a metaverse, and all what uh, it, like the creation of what's in a metaverse is what we're all able to access. So, for example, we've partnered with a different metaverse, not this one, who's about to launch shortly, and they're putting a whole education realm in there. So you can go into the virtual <laughs> world and learn. You can study uh, about blockchain and actually have live stream. Uh, we, you can sit in the room as an avatar or you can have live access, uh, live communication with trainers and whatnot. And they're building a full auditorium. And then to the point earlier about uh, creating 3D graphics, in that metaverse you can mint your own um, practical things inside of games. So you could, let's say, Millennial Falcon, Millennium Falcon, whatever. I just got that wrong. Um, <laughs> anyway, you could mint that creation inside of a metaverse and actually use it. So there's all sorts of cool things that can um, come to life in these realms. Again, this is just an example. There's plenty uh, plenty more things that we can look at. And I, I'd say we'll just jump out of there so jump no out one of else there. gets motion sick. Yep. And if you don't mind, Justin, we'll uh, flip across to the uh, computer one. Yep. OK, so Austin. This is you. Now, well, this is actually you. There's, uh, we're going to just give it another quick example because this is actually uh, relevant. This is actually something ca uh, called Stadius that's actually rolling out across Gold Coast venues. And I guess this is, a, this is more of real life, well, they, they're all real life practical uh, solutions. But here's a, a solution that you're actually going to see. See, over the last couple of years with COVID and all of that sort of stuff, we've become really used to walk in, scan a QR code, whether you like it or not, it's become part of our lives, right? So this particular app, literally, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty uh, amazing what they've actually done from a functionality point of view. You'll actually see it going live shortly. Uh, literally, you walk in, you scan your QR code, it sets up a Web3 wallet for you. Um, they've done deals with, uh, and I'm not going to get into who, who all the deals have been done with, but I can tell you, you know, go and, go and do your research there because it's going to be really cool. They're not trying to sit there and uh, sell tokens and all that sort of stuff. It's functional use case. So you walk in, alcohol providers want to be able to get advertising. They spend big money on a billboard or handing out drinks and all of these sorts of things. So there, there's partnerships with, uh, with, uh, with alcohol providers and other sponsors that are able to actually have people interact to be part of the ecosystem, uh, which is actually pretty exciting. So people can go in, they'll get given first pour, they'll get given their drink, they go and literally burn their NFT at the bar, they can transfer it between, there's ticketing, there's NFTs from uh, whether it's sports events or some of the major venues that this is, this product actually gonna be at, that are actually gonna be able to be airdropped. You know how uh, companies go, oh, we're gonna put you in, well, some companies it might be a meat tray, another one it might be a car or an overseas holiday or what a, or an experience. These these are all things that are actually be, going to be able to be uh, dropped through this, and I'm not going to get into there too. A good simple example of how that could function, and uh, in in a practical sense, is let's say for example you went to the local footy stadium, and I think um, the Carrara Stadium when the Suns play, if they win over a certain amount, apparently everyone gets a Big Mac or something of that nature. I'm again I'm. I'm not sure of the details, but something along that, something along that line. So in that scenario, McDonald's is sponsoring all the Big Macs, and in order for someone to claim it, they've got to take their ticket and they've got to go to the the Maccas. And for McDonald's, it's, in that scenario, it would be very challenging to know, firstly, like exactly what game they went to, to track any of the data around, like well. Where are people mainly claiming? Are they local? Are they claiming from a different McDonald's store? Um, what was the what was the return on investment in that marketing campaign? Because they just there's just simply no metrics on it. In this situation, you airdrop them 
you could literally airdrop everybody in the entire crowd an NFT, which is go and claim your Big Mac. And they've got then that, that uh, information as to how many got claimed, what was that return, what was the interaction value of that. So there's all sorts of things that play into it with, and that's just, again, a marketing function or a marketing sales, upsell, branding function, which could come into uh, as an NFT, uh, which can be dropped through a platform and everyone would be able to use it without having any technical skills. You don't need to do anything. You literally get airdropped. Here's an NFT. And airdrop, by the way, is just, you just, it just arrives in your digital wallet. You don't have to do anything for it. It just literally gets dropped out of the air. Cool. So we're going to jump away from you got there. You a question? Well, it depends. Good question. Very Absolutely. Good question. Gas is a thing. Uh, and so for those who are unfamiliar with what gas is, gas is the cost of powering the transaction. Okay, so, and that's typically paid to the, the node who validates the transaction, depending on the type of blockchain. So, yeah, so it would depend again on the, on the blockchain. And so that just comes down to the commercial arrangement of the business model as to what is, like, what is a marketing campaign worth? Because if they've got direct metrics on touching, touch point and advertising directly to, let's say, 20,000 people simultaneously. They can guarantee that everybody in the crowd got it because you can validate that on the blockchain as a transaction log. And the same thing is the redemption. So that, that's a commercial thing. So it might be they say, well, we'd, we'd be willing to spend $50,000 to get to 20 people or, or $5,000, uh, sorry, 20,000 people or, or $5,000, whatever the number is, it doesn't really matter. As long as commercially that's viable on the blockchain, then that comes down to, again, which, which back, to what, uh, back to what's really important is the applied side of the business. Because mm -hmm. someone who's in love with Ethereum as the blockchain, uh, it wouldn't function in that environment because you'd get murdered on gas. It would be so expensive to run that you just couldn't function. Until, per transaction or no. Well, it just, it's no. not really based on a percentage. Um, it just depends on network demand and all sorts of things. So, so, so in that, in, in that um, example you just gave, yeah. so McDonald's are more interested in the event being effective and people going, not the individual? Um, well, look, it look, it's just an example. It, it was so just it's a example. hypothetical. So, um, yeah, I'm just trying to work out if that business model is much more around, let's, you know, broadly, are they looking at the effectiveness of that strategy versus the traditional Well, model for sure, there's yeah. different... metrics and they chase you up. It's for all sure. Of, it's all of it, really. There's different value yeah. propositions, and hence why that comes back to the same thing that we're talking about is applied versus technical. In the business modeling and the way to func uh, frame up a project, that's exactly what uh, the applied blockchain courses are about, is putting things through a framework to evaluate mm. business models, opportunities, uh, technical solutions, what interoperability is needed, things like that. Which so blockchain should you use? <laughs> and that's, uh, this is one of the things, it is, uh, the curriculum is agnostic, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through. So just, this is just a at a very high level, ETHview Alive um, is a visual of the Ethereum blockchain. So what, what you're seeing here is each of these boxes are what's called the block. So when we call it a blockchain, the reason why it's a block of data, and in all these tiny little circles are transactions that are filling the block. Now with Ethereum, about every 10 seconds, a new block is formed. So it's basically taking a whole pile of transactions, chucking them in a block, and then they become part of the blockchain network, uh, part of the blockchain history, anyway, transactions. Now, all of these little circles have different values of transactions. And you can see down here, currently there's 19,660 transactions in the pool, meaning that many are being, uh, are about to be validated. And it changes that every second. So now we're at 20, 25,000 roughly. And every single circle represents either a smart contract or a transaction, it could be a peer-to-peer -peer one, could, it could be many different things. And by <coughs> clicking on that in that environment, it takes you straight through to Etherscan, which is essentially a window to actually look, audit or look at the transaction itself. So we can see here the transactions pending, right? The, um, we, we know it's got a hash. It's going from this wallet down here to OKX being an exchange. So that means somebody's sending their Ethereum to the exchange right now. And the amount of Ethereum is a tiny little bit, or 
possibly what's happening here. Well, there's the gas peak. It, it's, oh, yeah, yeah, there you go. So ga gas in this situation is near nothing. Now, they might have set the gas fee to be low specifically for that transaction, which might mean it takes a lot longer to get validated because people choose not to validate transactions that... Uh, don't make that, the money. That don't make the money. So it's... Uh, Absolutely. People can pay, they will pay more, but then, you know, Ethereum does have, can have issues with... Um, they're, they're working on scaling solutions. Uh, but there is a lot of other blockchains. Um, we yes. can talk about that in... We're, we've got about... Uh, we're going to be getting into a question Q&A session in about uh, 10 minutes. A few minutes, yeah. A few minutes. So five let's... Five minutes, eh? Hey? Yeah, we might have to... We've got to leave that at five that, That's cool. We've, we've got to... We've just, we'll just get through the next couple um, because... Well, we've got this one. Yeah, this one. We can jump back to the... Yep. Awesome. So where are the actual opportunities um, Thanks, from man. the applied side? And this is pretty <laughs> relevant because... Uh, um, the reality is, is people sometimes see all this information and they get bogged down with the technical side. And the reality is, is that for every one of these areas, where are the job outcomes? Where are the job opportunities? Who's actually looking for people? And I can tell you right now, it doesn't matter whether you're sitting there and want, you're in the research side of things, or if you're a journalist and writing and actually want to have, you know, every time you open the Australian Fin Review or any of these newspapers, there's articles written in there about blockchain projects, about startups, about what the banks are doing, central bank digital currencies, um, you know, El Salvador having taken on Bitcoin as, uh, as, their, as their currency, digital transformation roles, blockchain consultants. Every blockchain project should have someone that is actually mapping the business thinking. If you don't map the business thinking, then the coding side, if you've ever, I don't know if you've ever given coders something to do and just gone, I want it to look like this. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. So, and look, the, the beautiful thing with uh, technical skilled people mm -hmm. is they, they have the skills. They can literally put things together. The downside is if they don't understand the commercial or value proposition you're trying to achieve in very clear detail, they tend to get extremely creative on the bells and whistles and you get a very high functioning um, gadget that maybe doesn't solve the problem you've uh, gone out to address. Not to say that some some people, uh, like lots of people have those skills and they can do both, but yeah. many of them don't as well. So yeah. it's um, like we've seen it, well, we you can get on coin market cap and you can scroll down the list and there's what thousands and thousands, thousands. of projects on there. And most of them will never see the light of day for the simple fact is, uh, and there's a really good meme, uh, meme for it. And I wish we, I wish I had to, uh, thought to put it in the slides, but it's basically a, a sketch of a, a horse, and it starts off as the idea on the left-hand side, the first third. Full unicorn. And it looks amazing, perfectly <laughs> sketched, and then the middle section is the, um, is it starts to be drawn like as though if I was drawing it, it's not particularly great. And then the head, being the execution of the project, is like drawn from like a three-year-old. And, and it's, it's a life, not a cycle. Good artist it's a life cycle of projects. <laughs> and often what happens is they, they come out with a great idea, but nobody's actually done the planning, which is the middle section. And then the execution means you end up with like a who knows what. It, and, it's no longer that beautiful horse you started with. And I think, uh, so, yeah. Well, the, one of the things that we've found specifically, and we'll talk, uh, you know, about job outcomes specifically around the diploma of applied blockchain, which also has units in AI, IoT and big data, and the advanced diploma of applied blockchain. And we're going to talk about them really specifically now because TAFE, uh, TAFE Queensland offers them here, which we're really excited about. Um, what, what type of outcomes or what type of people are actually going through this curriculum? Well, one of the things that I found really is, and you'll hear beating the drum everywhere in Australia in the tech, in the tech scene, is people need to upskill, reskill. There's not enough skilled tech tech people in Australia, there's going to be, well, millions of new jobs, or million new jobs. I mean, I was in with the Tech Council recently. There's going to be over another a million new jobs in the tech sector by 2025, I think it is. I can't, I can't remember the dates and stuff. But what I can tell you is blockchain and the emerging technologies is one of those major skill sets. You don't necessarily need a, to be a coder to be heavily involved in the tech sector. They're transferable skills. So we've got, for instance, in the last intake, there's a bunch of lawyers gone through. There's a bunch of accountants that have gone through. There's also people that were barbers gone through. People that are from mining have gone through. People who have... A, so really there's no, oh, well, hang on, what's the one type of demographic? What's the avatar of the, per, the, the type of student? 
The type of students that go through are people that want to make a change. People who sit there and go, hey, there's all of this cool stuff going on in the tech sector. How do I actually get a piece of that? You might be the innovator. You might want to work on projects. You might want to have an idea where you decide you want to disintermediate a system. You might want to be going advise on a startup. We've had people go through, they get three units in and they look at someone who's well-funded startups and they go, hang on, so this is, this is your project, right? Yep. How the hell have you managed to miss this, 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 and this? Like it's going to fall on its face. You see, when you're not using, when you're not using a proper business map, try, like trying to, I mean, I'm no homing pigeon, right? So if you drop me in a city where I don't know anyone and I don't know where I'm going and say, drive there, I've got no idea where I'm going. I'm going to be going around in circles. I'm going to be going all over the place. I'm going to maybe ask a couple of people, ask people by the side of the barbecue, what do you think? What do you think? The data I'm getting may or may not even be correct. This is a roadmap for people to be able to actually go from ideation all the way to creation. Uh, and the opportunities there are absolutely endless. And if you're an entrepreneur, it's an entrepreneur's dream. That's right. Create the um, so pretty much any, any industry, I'm happy to have conversations and throw some questions afterwards as to what, you know, if you've got questions about what type of industries are, uh, are in. So let's, uh, let's uh, you know, if you can yeah, so wrap this one up. Just to round this out and open things up for questions, uh, so the Advanced Diploma of Applied Blockchain and the Diploma of Applied Blockchain are available uh, at TAFE. Uh, both of them have VSL funding. Currently, the diploma also has unrestricted job trainer funding, meaning anyone, even if you're employed and currently working, doesn't matter of age, is able to ac access the job trainer, meaning it's $144 for the entire thing, no student loans, uh, nothing else to pay around that. Uh, there are some conditions being like, if you've used job trainer before, you can't now double dip, all this sort of stuff. There. But read the T's and C's. I'll talk <laughs> to the TAFE uh, people who know the T's They're and awesome. C's um, and, and get clarity on that. But that's an opportunity to really get amongst it fairly quickly. The important thing as well is the advanced diploma is very much the strategic mapping and planning. So it's, it's the critical thinking, whereas the diploma is more the implementation and management side of it, like actually uh, deploying the plans and, and working things out. It's all project-based learning, meaning you're getting your hands dirty and you're actually doing it, and it's pragmatic and formative. So what you learn in Unit 1, you'll leverage into Unit 2 and so on as, as you uh, work your way through the curriculum. And I think one of the other things that's really important is every student's outcomes ends up being completely different. So we get some students that are coming out that are building stuff in Metaverse, some people that are coming out that are building solutions around every student comes out with their own innovation and every student comes out with their own portfolio, which is uh, actually pretty outstanding and not generally the way things are done. So um, any questions, uh, fire out. We're, uh, I, know, I know a couple Thanks of people guys. have to leave. Thanks for coming, guys. Enjoy really appreciate class. it. Enjoy the class. But um, now we can uh, have... Uh, I was, you're locked in, see? You aren't going to get out that easy. <laughs> It's a push door. It's a push door. <laughs> We've all done that. Uh, Karen, are we at Q&A um, at time? Yes, Q&A time. Q&A time. Okay, so we'll, what we'll do is just open up, open up the floor for any questions. Um, we sort of figured we'd, uh, we'd allow a little bit of time for questions, if anyone's got any questions, or if any questions come in from uh, online, just uh, call them out. Question. You, you can, can ask, ask as many, many as you want now. No, no, ask as many questions as you so want now. Excuse me if I'm not getting this right. That's okay. Yeah. I'm trying to get a handle on yeah. I'm going back a few stages. <clears throat> sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, the, what you're talking about is essentially a reward based system rather than a punishment. You know that when you're talking about. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's no, the I'm, carrot, not the stick. Way carrot. Of it. It's just because where I come from, it's all mm. about screen and media and monetizing yep. content. Yep. 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 Mm. In that yep. Yep. they just haven't yep. been able to make it work. That's right. So I was interested because I thought that's your, this is the exact opposite approach. So rather than yep. punishing exactly. you by going, if you don't do it, you're what you're doing then. Yep. You're, it's, have I got that right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So the, uh, I'll like take this one for sure. Yeah. And this is funny because the very first um, project. project we worked on, part of the 
planning that we came up with was what we called um, incentivized gift marketing. Now, we were going to call it an ethical bribe because in the marketing world, that's uh, it's actually a thing. <laughs> we thought, no, right? you can't and, do and that. <laughs> the ethical bribe uh, many of us are familiar with is it's like put your email in and you'll get an e-book or a whatever, mm. right? Some thing. So it's a, they're bribing you to provide information. Data. Data, yeah, exactly. And mm. so then they can remarket and market and market and you get bombarded with all this spam. Now, at the end of the day, we thought, well, what if you flipped it on its head? What if instead of the advertiser who wants to reach their audience, they engaged directly with the audience and provided the value to them? So you monetize, as a consumer who's being advertised to, you've got brand engagement. You're now engaging with the brand on some level. Maybe it's that you watch a video or you're connecting with them or you're liking them on Facebook or whatever it might be. Uh, parameters can be set, right? And the idea of that is then the company is rewarding you as a consumer for that engagement. Now, the beauty of that is what? Is that strengthens brand awareness than the other. Like I know if, if someone starts sending me, if I've, if I've connected to some site and it asked me for an email, and if I'm silly enough to use my normal email instead of like a, a junk collecting email, and then now my, fit, my email feed is full of emails from them, I don't care what, how good their product is, Unless I wanted to read every one of those emails, it's going to junk mail yeah. as far as I'm concerned. I'll cool. unsubscribe, I'll be out of there, they'll yeah. never get contact with me again. And the next time I come across their product, I won't purchase it for that same reason. I'll be like, you know yeah. what, that experience wasn't particularly fun for me. So now I'm, I'm quite a cold and candid um, internet person in that sense. Like I, I, I'm, You're heartless. Yeah, I'm, heart, You're heartless. I'm, heartless, I'm heartless to the junk mail and the spam. I just don't have time for emails yeah. that, I'm, that are unsolicited. Yeah. Right. So I'm like, but if that person just, if instead of giving me junk mail, they connected with me in a form that was value, not just spam, not trying to sell me more stuff, but yep. engagement. And it was something that I go, if I engage, I get rewarded. If I don't, it doesn't inhibit my experience. I'm going to engage, I get rewarded. And a perfect one is, uh, is gamification. So let's say in the metaverse, and this is what I'd do if and I had Fortnite, a metaverse. And all of these other in all of the game games. environment, because they're, they're all uh, moving into the blockchain space uh, with digital assets, every one of them. What I would do in those gaming environments, and I'm giving away some great opportunity for people, is, um, is I would create interactive ads that are gamified, that are part of gameplay. So that strengthens brand. So it might be... In, it might be a survival game and you've got to cut down a... The, and there's a sign there and you, you cut it down and, and you get rewarded with something in gameplay. And every time I'm now engaging with that brand, I'm getting reward, reward, reward. So you know how good I feel about that brand compared to spam, spam, spam. I don't want to listen anymore. Or reward, reward, now I've got something to show for it. Now next time I go to um, wherever it is, let's say the... To, to, go, to go by pizza or whatever, and that's the brand that has been part of the gameplay, it's part of my survival, I'm going, well, I'm going to go to that one because they've been paying me. I like them that little bit more than their competitor who didn't give me anything, right? And so the, the getting paid thing like. could also be, you know, chopped up a pizza and got a new sword. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, no, it yeah. really, uh, yeah. Strangely, some of the principles you're talking about are from very old sort of yeah. regenerative of content that was mm. strategies. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. it's taking away that. So yeah. I, I just know now and I know that mm. struggle to add things. Yeah. It's going to be an interesting one, I think, uh, also as we move from Web 3 to Web 4. So Web 3 is, you know, basically your wallet interacting and you're not having to deal with it. Web 4 is pretty much machines talking to machines. And you can imagine, I mean, you can see some of these major plays that guys like uh, Elon Musk are making. Whether you like him or not, you gotta you gotta see like you, you can see some of these things, and you know you can imagine driving down the street in you know a Tesla in the future, and you're sitting there, and whatever you're watching on your windows, you know you'll actually be you know paying for what you're watching, or you'll be being paid to listen to whatever you know other content or advertisements, right? You're going to have a choice, uh, or you'll be interacting with a person, or you'll be interacting with something because. A lot of this stuff's going to be autonomous. But you also have choice. So, for instance, Nathan's got a Tesla. I might be sitting and go, well, I need to get there faster. 
there's a whole lot of traffic on the road. So you're going to actually have cars communicating with each other, going, hey, you don't care to take a little bit of extra time and get paid for that inconvenience. And uh, I don't care to pay for the convenience of getting there a bit faster. So literally, they will be communicating and there'll be micro transactions that are happening uh, in between vehicles and in between other data points that are actually going to be um, used and IoT devices and not, and this is just one small example. This is the world we're moving into. Um, and, and it's approaching fast. And it's approaching fast. You know, people think, oh, that's ages away, that's Star Trek. But the reality is, well, they, didn't look they... at the mobile phones we're using. Look at, the, look at, I mean, seriously, you know, you, you gotta be kidding me. Like, you know, I mean, when I was a kid, you know, we had these, you'd see people walking around with suitcase phones. And that was when I was like, 12 or 13 and now you know you can I mean the technology in a mobile phone you can is absolutely incredible so the technology that's going into the car into cars and the technology that's going into everything else needs ways of being secured needs ways of being able to reward people needs these are all things that are needed and they're all things that are happening anyway yeah they built the first flying car airport yeah yep that's right yeah it's coming it's coming, but you also need to secure all of these de these devices. What was the I mean, name of that one you said mask. What was sorry? I'm MetaMask. MetaMask. M E T A M A S K. Yeah. Um, it's the Fox. Yeah. It's the Fox one. Yep. And yeah, look, there's plenty of wallets and plenty yep. of um, different ways you can connect with Web three, but that's a simple one because it's um, there's been a fair bit of uh, development on it in the sense of plugins for browsers and yep. it's like got Chrome extensions and whatnot, so you don't need to. Again, you don't need to be super technical about it. You just install the plugin, and then pin it to your pin it to your And there's, top there's a little setup. It's very clear instructions, and in you yeah. go. And then, uh, as blockchain uh, evolves, and it, it's certainly evolving ex extremely fast, super the wallets fast. are getting more interoperable. So currently, there's um, different blockchains, right? So it's kind of like at the moment, it's like let's say a different database yeah. per se. Say. Might be but building on Algorand or Ethereum yeah. or Solana or there's lots of there's different so many of so them. many different blockchains and they've all got different functionalities. Yeah, and but we're getting closer to the to the stage where you'll have a functional wallet, uh, like the digital wallet, will be um, interoperable interoperating with any of the chains. So we're getting closer, and some of them like MetaMask has function to to yeah. um, have multiple different chains. Yeah. So you don't need to have a wallet for this blockchain, a wallet for this one, this one, this yeah. one, and now you've got wallets scattered like brown cows. You can't remember all your <laughs> logins and whatever. Uh, so it's getting simpler and simpler by the day. Yeah. So any other questions, comments, things you'd like to know? I have a million, but I'll, I'll try. <laughs> yeah, throw, throw another one <laughs> out right, there. We've got because, uh, like, questions. Uh, yeah. I know a bit, so I don't know everything. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Um, I suppose I'm still struggling to understand the measurability for, and, and it's probably because I've got my head in a, a more traditional space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I say traditional, everything's evolving so fast. Yeah. It's not really traditional, is it? But, um, you know, like, uh, how the companies are going to make the money and measure it. That, I guess that's what I was asking uh, yeah. with the McDonald's example. Yeah, yeah. It's like, so, it seems like they can tap into how many people got that. So, so there, there's a few ways. That, I think this the that's exactly what the, the curriculum's about. What they need is they need someone who's a blockchain strategist to come in and literally sit down and map their whole user journey and sit down and go, okay, these are the metrics that we've got. These are the metrics that we're looking to create. These are the parts that where blockchain's relevant. Here's the parts where blockchain completely is not relevant. You just need good UI, UX, and you, you need good software. Because a lot of the time, it's just as important to know when not to use blockchain as when to use it. Mm. So that's th that's exactly exactly your conversation, is uh, me sitting, uh, us trying to answer that in a couple of line sentence. That's not what's that's not how yeah. it works. You, they literally need to sit down. Now, the other thing they could do is go and pay one of these major companies that's been around for a long time, millions of dollars, for a viability study and and that's what they do they pay big mm. money just for a viability study just to see if it's a viable business model and our curriculum was designed specifically 
for people to be able to do that. And the fact that they've got stackable skill sets, so someone, for instance, there, they're obviously, they might need legals, they might need accounting, right, specifically, or they might need people with marketing. And that's why our curriculum specifically, the background that someone's bringing and those stackable skill sets make a huge difference in the type of people that, uh, and the type of outcomes that are actually gonna come out on the other side of that. So that's why we are getting so many people from these different industries. Um, and coming and uh, going through it. And as, as we move further in the future, there'll be people who solve industry-wide problems or yep. comp company-wide problems or mm -hmm. just process-wide problem. Yeah. So, and that that's just, again, evolution. So we know of a student who went through uh, the advanced diploma earlier on uh, who was consulting for a business and they're, they're quite a large company, but that yep. it was a regular consulting gig that uh, he had. And he went in there and he mapped out he actually talked to them when he started his advanced diploma and said, hey, listen, I've got an idea of using your business to identify a few, um, like, basically touch points where there's uh, inefficiencies and see if we can disintermediate mm -hmm. it using blockchain. But before I start and, on, and work on this project, I want to know, if I do this and I can find a solution, would you guys be willing to fund it if it's viable? And they went, yeah, sure, no problem, right? He went away, he mapped out their business processes and everything. It took a long time because big company and lots and lots mm. and lots and lots of data points and lots of contact points and all this stuff. And he found one problem where they were re-entering data something like 17 times through the life cycle of a customer. Because it just, just because it was like a patchwork quilt with most business. As you grow, you don't always go back and look at all your systems and go, well, how can we consolidate the processes? So he, he found a function they were doing 17 times the data entry on this one life cycle of a, of a customer. Now, the customer didn't have the bad experience, but the people kept read data, uh, more data entry, more data entry. And, and he looked at that and said, what if I could disintermediate that process so when they sign up, they get an identity, similar like what I was talking at the beginning about a sovereign identity. In that case, it's just an internal one. And we run a smart contract, so every time they need to do things, it will pull that data already. So he, he ma mapped that out and took it back to them. And it, I think they, um, on his viability study or feasibility study in that, he, he found something around $7 million of inefficiency per year, right? So, and then he figured the project's probably gonna cost about three or 400,000 to do. Um, so he, he basically said, look, I've come up with the solution. Here it is, the numbers work. And off they went. So now he's cons he's taken that uh, role to consult and put implement that into their business. So um, yeah, look, there's there's unlimited opportunities, and and when we say that, we mean it. Like there's there's no boundary to this thing. Uh, in the case of media marketing and that, like it's evolving, and I think we we are going full circle because before all the social media platforms, it was a quiet environment. When you started advertising mm. on Facebook and stuff, you got a lot of reach. Now it's just a it's a noise box really hard to cut through, well, what could you do differently? Give a different value proposition which changes the business model. Mm. And most, most uh, companies and, and whatnot can't, uh, can't pivot to that model because it's not viable to operate in that, um, in that way with traditional legacy models. It, it's just, it, you gotta break the model and rebuild it. They do, yeah. yeah. They keep Yeah, it's, yeah. it's like, re I always think about it like this. If you could reimagine how it could be and start with a blank canvas and no expectations and just simply say, let's take the best of what we need along the way, but reimagine that model, what would it look like? And then you come up with some crazy cool ideas and you're like, how come we're not doing that? And exactly to your point, the reason why they're not currently doing that is because people are dragging their legacy thinking forward. And, and I say it like this. The future is out the windscreen. All of how we've been doing everything is a rear view mirror. Sometimes when you're driving down the highway, you can glimpse in the rear view mirror just to make sure, you know, whatever, you've gone where you, I don't know why you need to do that. But <laughs> let's say there is a rear view mirror for going backwards, not going forwards, right? So let's say you just rip that out, you throw it out the windscreen. Emerging technologies, web three, web four, all of the future is out the windscreen. If you were looking in the rear view mirror driving 110 down the highway, and you weren't looking out the windscreen and you're planning on getting to the destination of the future using old thinking and old visions, you're likely gonna run off the road somewhere. 
So rather than having that uh, business fatality, let's just start focusing on how it can be and take all of the skills that uh, benefit the future and build out what we want. So that's how I think about it every day. I'm like, well, what are we creating here? What are, where are we heading? Because we, we have an input in that. So, yeah, I'm, far away. I've got a pretty basic knowledge of blockchain. But Thank you. Cheers. doesn't have to be um, because there's just as much sorry was it, that, that was a question yeah because just as just as much so it can be used for the consumer securing their data and then choosing what they share and what they don't share yeah. so you know unfortunately some of these big companies they just go oh yeah you opted in and the fact that you didn't update your privacy settings every time we push a new privacy agreement through uh, means that you know they own you right versus you know you being able to actually go well hang on i've for instance validated my identity once i can choose what is accessed or if i want to sell my data that's uh you know there is companies that are building stuff around you know people having it, it's about people having that choice um and it depends what the blockchain solution is what the the what the parameters around whatever project they're building is too um but Blockchain as a, as a technology and is is really going to allow a lot of these other tech stacks to have different ways of being able to secure and hold value for that data. Um, it's not you can't put the genie back in the bottle, um, but we can we can do the best we can to sort of move forward from where we're at and actually give, start to take back some sort of control and and uh, and, and one other point uh, to that same topic is just to be very clear that. Blockchain doesn't solve every single problem and not everything should be on blockchain. Yep. So there's a lot of existing tech, a lot of existing systems that yep. you would leverage. And there might be just a tiny touch point where you're writing to the chain for a certain uh, specific reason. Or sometimes it is that you build a, a decentralized app or a DAP uh, for the purpose of being able to like run totally in a decentralized format, but it, it comes down to the application again. It's like yep. some applications, it's not worth touching with blockchain just simply because it's not, yep. right? There's, there, it, it fun if it functions well and it's not broken and it's as efficient as possible, don't, don't break touch it, it and yeah, make it a blockchain break solution it, just for the sake of using yep. blockchain. That's a waste of time, yep. right? You got it. So everything's got to be looked at on its own merits, but there is some really unique things that come out of using mixed technologies and sometimes going fully decentralized. It just depends on the needs. Yep. So I hope that kind of makes sense. Yeah. On that note, is there any, any other questions? Or we, because I just want to say any a big questions thank Questions from the top? No, I just nah. want to say okay. a big thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, to TAFE Queensland and DigiTrek, this is, uh, this yeah. is our second time. And Karen. And, and Karen Graham. If you've got any questions. And Justin, um, and, Justin, and, Justin. and Justin in tech. You know, I really appreciate uh, everyone you know, actually having a bit of a, a listen to what we've got to say, but uh, and TAFE for hosting it and being involved and in everything they're actually doing. And Karen, Karen's an uh, absolute legend. If you want to uh, get in touch and find out any other details or you've got any questions, just get in touch with uh, Karen Graham and uh, she'll be able to help you. Yeah, Enjoy the rest of DigiTrek. Sorry? Yeah, and the TAFE team. Of uh, course. And the TAFE team, of course. They're wonderful. Uh, and just literally, you know, dive in, have a look, do some research because uh, it is a fun place to play. There's going to be a whole lot of other events uh, following up uh, around DigiTrek, around AR, VR, robotics, all sorts of really, really cool subjects uh, and topics that all sort of layer on the emerging tech uh, area. It's a lot of fun, great space to play and have fun and and learn and dive down the rabbit holes, which is the, the world we live in today. So cheers, thank you all. Awesome. And uh, thank you. have a good one. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks for the standing ovation. <laughs> I'll give you.